I know um, that my little occasional obsessions can get a little bit tedious for those of you who may not share my predilections towards certain things, particularly certain movies. But in my defense this morning, it would be almost impossible, it seems to me, at least it is for me, it would be almost impossible to read the gospel reading or to hear the gospel reading as Judith just read it a moment ago, almost impossible to hear that gospel reading and not think about a particular movie. It's almost impossible to hear that reading from Matthew 22, at least for me, and not find my mind going towards Terrence Malick's recent film, A Hidden Life. Jesus finds himself in a slightly awkward position with the Pharisees. They are plotting to entrap him, and they set for him a fairly uh, sophisticated, awkward, and difficult trap. Should you pay taxes to Caesar, to the emperor, or should you not pay tax to Caesar? To say no is to be branded an insurrectionist, to be branded someone who is trying to work against the authorities of the day, and almost certainly to risk execution. To say yes is to be branded a collaborationist. You are someone who supports this tyrannical, unjust, oppressive regime of the emperor. So you're really, you're really caught between a rock and a hard place. And it's precisely that place where Franz Jägerstatter found himself in 1943 in Austria, caught between, on the one hand, his sense of conscience, his sense of what was the right thing to do, and on the other hand, the demands of the Nazi regime under which he was and all of his village were living. And there's a strange little element in this story in Matthew 22 that might, you might easily skip over and not pay any attention to at all. Matthew says, Jesus, aware, after they've posed this question, Matthew says, Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? And then he says, show me the coin used for the tax. He doesn't just reach into his pocket and pull out a coin and say, well, look at this coin. He doesn't turn to his followers and say, okay, somebody give me a denarius. I want to make a point here and then hold it up. He asks them, the Pharisees, to produce the coin. And I think that's very intentional because what Jesus wants them to to acknowledge is that they are in fact themselves already participating in, implicated in, and sharing in the system of Caesar. Whether they like it or not, they are in fact all taking part in this unjust regime of oppression and injustice that they are all laboring under. He wants them simply to acknowledge that. And I think we all need to acknowledge that. All of us, without exception, we all live under, to some degree, under Caesar. Now, we're fortunate, we're blessed largely in Canada that that doesn't involve massive injustice and massive oppression, but it involves a lot of injustice for many people. We live in a regime, we live under a system that oppresses people whose lives are trapped in poverty, who are victims of racism, uh, women who are oppressed and abused. We live in a system that doesn't treat every human being completely equal and offer to every person in the world uh, equal opportunities. That's just a reality. And I think the starting place for any kind of honest response is first to acknowledge that. 
We all live under Caesar, and Caesar sometimes doesn't get it right. As hard as Caesar may try to get it right, Caesar gets it wrong a lot of the time. And that's pretty much where Jesus leaves it. I don't think Jesus is ducking the question here. But what he's doing is he is asking his audience to look into their own hearts and ask themselves, how do I live with integrity, authenticity, and sincerity in this situation in which I find myself? And that's the question we all need to face. And I don't think they did. And the story ends, when they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. They don't want to hold the awkward and difficult question. If you've seen the movie, you may have come away from the film feeling a tiny bit dissatisfied, as if not everything was completely resolved. It's a Terrence Malick film. What were you expecting? But the reality is, I think Terrence Malick was using exactly the same device that Jesus used in his teaching. Terrence Malick wanted to raise the question of Franz Jägerstetter. How do you respond as a person with deep convictions? How do you respond as a person of faith when you find yourself being called upon to swear an oath of loyalty to an unjust ruler. And make no, it doesn't come in the, it doesn't come in the film, but the oath that Jägerstadter would have had to swear in the face of, in, in the army, in order to be able to join the army, which he would have had to swear whether he'd gone as a, as a, a medic or as a soldier. It was pretty blood curdling. The Wehrmacht oath of loyalty to Hitler, which became law in 19, that he would have had to uh, swear in 1943, says, I swear by God this holy oath that I will render to Adolf Hitler, Fuhrer of the German Reich and people, supreme commander of the armed forces, unconditional obedience, and that I am ready as a brave soldier to risk my life at any time for this oath. So is it right to swear the oath of loyalty to Hitler? Or is it wrong to swear the oath of loyalty to Hitler? Terence Malick and Jesus say, you decide. You have the courage to examine your own heart. Terence Malick makes no judgment upon those people who made a different decision than Franz Jaeger said. He doesn't demonize them. Some of them aren't very nice, admittedly, but he doesn't demonize them. He doesn't castigate them. He doesn't preach sermons against them. He simply lets their decision stand, as with Franz Jägerstetter's decision. The challenge is always not to apply some external code and say, okay, now I've seen the movie, now I know what I should do in that situation. The challenge is to let the question work on us so that our hearts may open to a deeper place because that's where the wisdom lies. The wisdom lies deep in the innermost secret room of your heart. That is the place Jesus calls us to. And so the question really from, from, this, from this text, I think, is how am I going to find that place within myself where there's wisdom, where there's truth? How am I going to come? What disciplines, what practices am I going to develop in my life that will help support my awareness of my own integrity and of the truth of Jesus that dwells in my being. And it's interesting, I, I think I see, I see at least five, I'm not going to speak about them all, I'm just going to list them, so don't panic. I think I see five uh, pointers 
in the movie that helped Franz Jägerstetter uh, find that place within himself. And the first one is silence. I've never seen a movie, I don't think I've ever seen a movie with less dialogue than A Hidden Life. There's lots and lots of quiet people walking around. And Franz Jägerstetter, who's the star of the film, probably had fewer lines to memorize for the movie than any other major star for any other major film in the history of filmmaking after silent films. So his ability to just be in silence was one of the things that helped him open to his deep sense of conscience. Another thing that figures very prominently in the film is simply beauty. Beauty, the beauty of creation that's all around him. The beauty of, of life, of all that he sees. The beauty in the film of the music. There's, as with almost all Malik films, there's beautiful music. And beauty exists to help our hearts open to a deeper place. That's what beauty's for. It's not to worship the beauty. It's to open to that deeper place within ourselves that the beauty calls us to. So silence and beauty. And then, of course, very closely aligned with beauty is creation. The creation, the, the massive force of creation swirling around in the mountains, the incredible majestic mountains that come up all over um, that aren't all, as Stacy pointed out to me last week, and he's right, they aren't all uh, Austrian mountains. Uh, some of them are, where did you say, Stace? Northern Italy. Northern Italy. Say some of the filming was done in Northern Italy. Uh, so there's, but there are extraordinary mountains, the fields uh, blowing in the wind, the, the grain ready for harvest, just so much of creation is just there in this film. You can't escape it, except when you end up in Berlin in a prison, and then you're cut off from creation, from truth. So silence, beauty, and creation. And then the last two may seem a tiny bit contradictory, but I think they fit together. Silence, beauty, creation, and then loneliness and love. Franz Jägerstetter was very, very isolated from his community in his decision and in his choice. He was alone in this decision. And if we are going to find that deeper place within ourselves, we are going to need to be able to spend time with ourselves and with God, alone time. We're going to need to separate ourselves to some degree for some time, to step aside from all of the prevailing massive influence and impact of culture all around us, to stop interacting for a little while, to be alone, to listen. And I think that's actually one of the essential qualities that enables love to happen. One of the, probably one of the stars in the movie is the relationship between Franz and his wife, Franziska. They had, by all accounts, and certainly uh, his letters bear it out, they had a beautiful, profound, deep, and loving relationship. But that kind of love only comes to people who can be alone. You know, it's nurtured in that place where we know that we have the capacity to stand on our own two feet as people, as individuals. Where we know that we're not entering into a relationship simply out of need for companionship and need for someone to be there to hold us up and support us. True love is born out of freedom, the freedom of not needing other people, the freedom of not being utterly dependent and overly attached to other people. And Franz Jägerstetter had all of those experiences. He had the experience of silence, the experience of beauty, experience of being surrounded by the awesome reality of creation. He had deep loneliness being on his own, and he had a profound love. And all those things point us, they call us, to that deeper place where we will be able to decide for ourselves 
what is Caesar's and what is God's, where we will be able to have the wisdom and the guidance in our hearts that allows us to discern what integrity and honesty is for us. Last thing, be really clear. The question is not for me to decide how you should answer the question. Jesus never told anyone to vote NDP or liberal or green. That's pretty much your options this coming week, isn't it? It's Communist Party of Canada, they're running anybody? No, a couple of independents maybe. Jesus never instructed, I mean, they couldn't vote anyway, but he never instructs anyone how to vote. And it's not my job and it's not your job to tell anyone. It's our job to call one another to deep listening, to heart opening, to that place of wisdom that Jesus always called us to find in our hearts.